those of you that don't know me, I'm Randy Kindig. I'm a member of the uh, Ten Assembly team uh, organizers. And uh, I, I do want to say that the, the group has been very uh, overwhelmed by the response to last year's show. And uh, everyone supported this year's show, from the exhibitors to the speakers to uh, the attendees uh, to the sponsors. And we appreciate everyone who has helped support the show. I want to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we are very honored uh, to have a special a keynote speaker here. He has a long and distinguished career in the technology field. And uh, I'm going to just briefly run through Stuart Chappé's um, bio here. It's hard to keep it short because he has, a, has such a long, distinguished career. Uh, he has been called, Stuart Chappé has been called the original TV techie and the dean of television computer journalists. He pioneered the field over 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, with his show, The Computer Chronicles, which I'm sure many of you know and uh, are familiar with. I remember watching that show back in the 80s and, and just loving the fact that there was a show about computers at that time. And always hoping that he would talk about my computer on the show that, you know, that week, but um, it was a great show. He served as host and managing editor of Computer Chronicles. He anchored another public television show dedicated to the internet called Internet Ca or Net Cafe. Both series were broadcast nationally and throughout the world in over 100 countries for 20 years. His programs were still popular online, regularly downloaded, and viewed by fans all around the world. Stewart has been a guest commentator on National Public Radio's All Things Considered, has hosted a weekly web radio talk show called Talking About This Week. He wrote and co-anchored a syndicated radio series about the internet called Cyber Traffic Report. He's won numerous awards for his broadcast journalism work, including a CPA Award for Best Individual Technology Television Program of the Year. He was named by Adwick Magazine as one of the five most influential broadcast journalists in the field of technology. He's written for publications such as Windows Magazine, PC Magazine, Silicon Valley Magazine, The Prize Magazine, and Digital Video Magazine. And he also published the Chappé Newsletter, which was a monthly newsletter for personal computer users. He's a graduate of USC with a degree in mathematics and psychology. He also holds a doctorate in law from Harvard and was a Benton Fellow in Technology Journalism at the University of Chicago. Stuart will talk about his early experiences with Radio Shack computers. He'll talk about Computer Chronicles, of course, and an update on what he's done since the show. We're very honored to have all of you to come to our show, which celebrates the contributions that Tandy Radio Shack made to the computer and technology field. And we're very honored to have Stuart Chappé here to help us kick it off. So I got a mic next to the speaker. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, cool. And we heard it all in the last couple of seconds of what was the opening theme of Computer Chronicles. But I'm going to start with actually playing a clip of a show we did, which many of you may have seen. It was devoted completely to Tandy and Radio Shop Computers, done back in 1991, so over 25 years ago. So let's take a look at this. And when your radio broke down, you would take one of these out of the bag. Take it down to a store like this called a Radio Shack, test it, buy a new one, and probably buy some other electronic junk while you were here. <laughs> now, kids are just as likely to walk out of a Radio Shack store carrying computer software or a brand new 386 PC. For from the Model 1 to the Model 100, from the color computer to the new multimedia PCs, Andy Radio Shack has played a significant role in the growth of personal computers. Today, we take a look at Tandy computers then and now 
on the special edition of the Computer Chronicles. As we'll see in a minute, you guys think Model 1 was my first computer, and it still works in 1991 when we did the show. So I brought it out into the studio, and you'll see this fun demo. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Game Store Technologies. Over the course of the 20 years we were on, we had uh, maybe 30 different advertisers or uh, underwriters, as we call them, and we call them the and we kept on rotating and rotating until we ran out of them. I'll talk about that one. Mail order Welcome to Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffet, and this is my first computer. The old TRS-80 Model 1 dug it out of the garage this morning. I bought it back in 1978. It's the computer I first learned how to program on, learned all about microcomputers, and look what a difference 12 years can make. This old bulky keyboard, the CPUs inside here, old-fashioned keyboard, cables all over the place, separate power supply, storage device, Radio Shack cassette recorder. Uh, here is the program right here. You get your program on your cassette, Pop it in the cassette machine, adjust the volume very, very carefully, hit it, maybe if you're lucky, 10 minutes later, you've got a program. This is a classic program. Uh, let me load it up here for you in one second. And this is called the Dancing Demon. Oh, okay. So this runs in less than 16K of memory. When I bought the computer, it came with 4K. I had to spend $200 extra to upgrade it to 16K. And here it is. Multimedia in the 70s. Well, a lot of people used to make fun of the TRS-80, call it the trash 80 and so on. But the fact of the matter is that over the years, Candy has been pretty innovative. They virtually invented the laptop market with the Model 100. They were the first to come up with a friendly user interface bundle integrated software desk make. In fact, they've done quite a few interesting things. And today, we're going to look at some of the great Tandy Radio Shack history, and we'll see the newest multimedia products from Tandy, your new company, Grid. Now, if there is any dedicated group of old computer users, it is certainly the people who still love their Coco, the Tandy Color Computer. Yeah. We start with a visit to the Color Computer Users Group in Santa Clara, California. No, the Radio Shack Color. All right, we don't have time for all of that. If you want to see the whole show, it's online. It's called Tandy Slash Radio Shack. <laughs> so, let's move ahead. Can you guys hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So what I want to do is talk a little bit really about Computer Chronicles, my experience playing with all these old computers for going back now 30 years ago, I guess, when they all started. And kind of answer some of the questions that people always ask me about Computer Chronicles show, how it got started, and so on. Uh, I want to mention the other show we did for six years called Net Cafe, which was a lot of fun, all focused on the internet. I'll talk about some of the memorable moments I remember from doing Computer Chronicles in the studio. Uh, I want to talk about how we got Computer Chronicles online on the archive. In an archive, which is an interesting story. Some of the interesting people I met during the time we did Computer Chronicles. People ask me about why is there no more Computer Chronicles, so I'll talk about the demise of the show, and just a little bit about what I'm up to now. So how did this all start? Well, it was a very selfish endeavor, actually. I was a geek. I just bought my Model 1, TR-80, and there was very little support available at the time. As you know, there were, there were two computer magazines, I think, at the time, very high-end, not really for for dumb users like me. And uh, I was looking at a way to get some more information <coughs> on how to use my computer and how to do cool things with it. Besides having my Tandy computer, I was basically a gadget geek at the time. I, and to this day, I still have, what, I have three Amiga computers, a bunch of PCs, a bunch of Apples, I had a complete list of all PDAs that ever came out. Uh, I was a big fan of techie watches, so I had a whole collection of watches that were kind of high tech. I had the original laptop, which most people may not remember, was the HP Portable, which I have and it still works. Uh, one of my prized possessions was the first optical encyclopedia that came out from Activision, and then Activenture, a Grolier's encyclopedia on a laser disc. Mm -hmm. Didn't have enough room to fit it on the old CDs. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have that, very proud of it. My favorite floppy piece of antique stuff is the original five and a quarter inch Apple disc of Visicalc. So a lot of great old stuff, and I love that old stuff. So the problem is, how did you get help in those early days to figure out what you were doing with all these computers? So the basic place you went to for help was a user's group. 
So I went to a users group meeting in the Bay Area. I was working in the Silicon Valley area at the time. And I was fascinated by what happened at this users group meeting. I mean, it was really good, solid information that you really couldn't get anywhere else. And there were like 12 guys and some guys were on it. I said, this is such a waste of information. There should be thousands, tens of thousands of people being able to participate in this users group meeting, not just 12 guys in a garage. At the time, I was running a TV station, a PBS TV station in the Silicon Valley, and I thought, I want to make a TV show out of this. <clears throat> Let's televise these users group meetings so more people can benefit from them. And that's really how it got started. We started out with doing a, believe it or not, a live show, <coughs> demonstrating new technology, which didn't work at the time. We were very brave, a live show, Thursday nights, 8 to 9, in the Silicon Valley area. And it was hosted the first year, I didn't host it, I produced it. The host was Jim Warren, who had that to the first computer trade show, the West Coast Computer Fair. And basically, he'd come in the studio and invite his geek friends, and they would say, here's this new toy, here's this new thing I did. And I thought this was just sort of a community television, sort of a fun little thing we were doing. Some, for some reason, it took off people started to discover there was this show called Computer Chronicles. Again, just local, very low production value, no budget, everybody worked for nothing, and somehow it caught on. We decided, since it seemed so popular, that we would do something about this and try to make a better show with more production values and plan for a new show starting in the next season. Unfortunately, Jim Warren wasn't able to come on to the show because he was pretty busy doing other stuff. And he really wasn't that great, frankly, a television host. He was. It was great for the super geek community, but normal people couldn't really understand what he was talking about. So we said, let's try to not only build the show up, but make it a little bit more approachable for new users. And for some reason, the staff came to me and said, Stu, why don't you host it? Because I had been working as a reporter for the Lenny Business Report covering Silicon Valley. I had worked with my background was ABC News and CBS News, so anyhow, I ended up saying yes to do it. Problem is, we had to find the money to do the show. Again, we couldn't afford it. We're going to do a high-quality show that has syndication possibilities. We couldn't do it uh, on a dime the way we were doing it before. So we started looking around, who, who could we find to sponsor this show? Well, there was this company down the road it called Apple. And they just came out with the Apple II. And I thought, these guys are looking for customers. We're looking for a sponsor. So some of the people working with me contacted some of the people at Apple and said, we have this great idea. If you wanted to sponsor this new show called Computer Chronicles. And we met with the staff at Apple, their marketing people, their advertising people, their PR people. They all thought it was a great idea. They said, we're going to recommend this to Steve. Steve Jobs, of course. Uh, and see if we can, you know, we'll go ahead. So they actually wrote a memo to Steve saying, we recommend that Apple sponsor this new show on Computer Chronicles. So I was invited to make a presentation to the Apple board meeting with Steve sharing <clears throat> to give my final pitch as to why they should sponsor the show. Well, that was my first unpleasant experience with Steve Jobs. <laughs> first of many. So I was my turn on the agenda to make the presentation. I think I had four words come out of my mouth and interrupted me, which was his style. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, sure. Are you going to cover non-Apple products on your show? I said, well, sure. I said, it's a computer show. It's not an Apple show. You'll be a sponsor of the show. Well, why the hell should I give you money to promote my competitors? Follow me. I said, well, when you, my guess is when you take an ad in a magazine or a newspaper, you don't tell the editorial side, they're not allowed to do anything except cover Apple products. That's beside the point. I think they're a waste of money. <laughs> so he sat there like this, and he doing this, and let me think. I have a better way to spend that money. Let's spend it on, I got an idea, a Super Bowl commercial. That was the genesis of the famous 1984 Macintosh commercial in the Super Bowl. So I made the pitch, but CBS got the money. <laughs> a quarter million dollars. Anyhow, that was not a good experience. So we ran out of luck with Apple, and we decided to go somewhere else. Well, luckily, we found the complete opposite of Steve Jobs, a guy named Gary Kildall. Total gentleman, really cared about what we were doing, really cared about educating the public about personal computing technology. And we talked to Gary, and he said, why don't you come up, see me, we'll talk about this, see if we can help. Unfortunately, Digital Research, the company he was running, was 100 miles away from our studio, which is in San Mateo, California. Gary said, don't worry about it, I'm going to send my chopper down, we'll pick you guys up, we'll meet at San Carlos Airport, we'll fly you over here, we'll have a meeting, we'll fly you back. Wow, what do you got this is, right? Complete opposite from my previous experience. Um, so he said, uh, our chopper pilot will meet you at 2 o'clock at the cafeteria at San Carlos Airport. 
<clears throat> so a colleague of mine was standing there in the cafeteria at the San Carlos Airport. It's two o'clock. Can't see any cop chopper coming up. We're looking, we're waiting. I guess we made a mistake, something's wrong here, so we called Gary's office. I said, I don't, I don't see the pilot. Where is he? It's a she. My first lesson in sexism, I assumed the chopper pilot was a guy. <laughs> and it was this very capable woman who was the chopper pilot. You know, I'm, you're, I'm, you're the guys I'm waiting for. Anyhow, they flew us out to see Gary and have a met meeting, and he couldn't have been nicer. He said, look, I can't afford to give you all the money. We're looking for a quarter million dollars, but I will give you some seed money to help you find the money you need. I'll give you 25,000 bucks to help you find what you need to sponsor the show. And I saw when I met Gary how articulate he was and how smart he was and how nice he was. And he said, Gary, you know, I'm actually looking for a co-host kind of show. I'm just a journalist. I'm not really a techie. You're the techie guy. We could co-host this together. That would be a great combination. I'll do it. He was running a very big, successful company at the time called Digital Research. He agreed to go two full days a month to come, to come down to the Silicon Valley and co-host the show with me. This was actually fun because Gary, as you may know, was a pilot. So he would have a fly down. Gary also had a lot of money in the car nut, but he would drive down in his Lamborghini. His quarter million dollar Lamborghini. That was all budget for my show. You had a problem. <laughs> Anyhow, he volunteered to do it, and what a great decision that was. And we started to out. With the 25000 that Gary gave us, we actually were able to find a real sponsor. Our first sponsor of the show was a company called Microfocus, an English company that had just done an IPO, had a lot of cash sitting around. Nobody had ever heard of them in the United States. And their bit was, uh, transcoding COBOL programming for a personal computer. Anyhow, it worked out, and so with the money, money we launched a new show, a half hour show, uh, <clears throat> and which much, with much better production value. Now this was again started as a local show. We knew nothing about syndicating the show. We were just following our passion. So there was no internet, no cell phones, there was nothing, it was bulletin boards. <laughs> And somehow these guys on the BDS have started talking to each other around the country. This is the damn show in Silicon Valley it explains all this computer stuff. So the geeks started calling their local PBS station saying, why don't you carry your show? Manager of the station started calling me, say, how can we get your show? Just by answering the phone, three months later we were on in 20 cities around the country. This was viral before anybody had used the word viral. Oh, oh, it's wow. Wow. It just took off totally on its own. We never tried to sell it. It sold itself. And again, at the end of one year, we were on about 100 cities. At the end of two years, 200 cities. At the end of three years, we had international distribution. There was a French version, a Spanish version, an Arabic version. We were on in over 100 countries around the world with our little computer chronicle show that started out as a hobby. And then it just wouldn't die. <laughs> For 20 years, I kept on doing this game show. <laughs> I mean, this is a job, you know. I mean, I had a full-time day job running a TV station. So this was really just a, a, a hobby of love for me. Never got paid anything to do computer problems. It was just for fun. And unfortunately, about six or seven years later, Gary decided to move digital research from the Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas. Competition for talent at the time in the Valley was really tough. Prices were really hard for talent. Prices the cost of living was really high. Yeah, and of course, digital research was not the digital research that had been six years ago. Gary decided to move to Austin, where it was less expensive to run his company. And so we lost Gary as a co-host. We tried rotating co-hosts. I mean, I worked with different people and just turned out to be a mess. I had to keep on training people every other week about how to do the show. Finally, the staff came to me and said, why don't you just do it yourself? You know not find out. So I said, okay, I'll host it myself. Imagine what fun, if you're a geek like I was, loving all the new toys, all the new stuff that came out, have a job where you got the seed before anybody else saw it. And it was really, really likely to explain it to other people. I mean, this was not a job. This was just great fun. And matter of fact, there's a little anecdote I should share with you. We had, a, a, I think it was our first producer on the show, and we had trouble keeping people because the salaries were so high in the Silicon Valley. We were a little nonprofit still. So she was being recruited by some uh, high-tech PR firm in the Valley. They were offering to double her salary. And the interviewer said to her, why would you consider leaving that show? What's so great about working on Computer Chronicles? She says, because every day is like Christmas morning. I come to the office and there are boxes at the front door with all these new gadgets, all these new toys, and we get to play with them, and we get to see them before anybody else does. And that was the story of why everybody was in love with the show, at least the people who worked on it. 
Let me move over a little bit to the Net Cafe show, which never was as popular as Computer Chronicles, but it was interesting. I had the same experience. <clears throat> so I remember to start Chronicles, I went to this user's group meeting, decided there should be more than 20 people watching this thing. Let's make a television show. At that time, about mid-1990s, there were these things called cyber cafes, or internet cafes started. And one of the big ones originally was something called Cybersmith. They opened a big store in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Harvard. They opened a store in Palo Alto, near Stanford. And I used to hang out at the cyber cafe at Stanford in Palo Alto. And this was the same experience I'd had all over again with Chronicles. This was great stuff. People were really explaining the new websites and how you do stuff and how you stream and so on and so forth. This would be a television show. And I said, let's do it. So the next year we started this new show called Net Cafe. Same idea, except it was different. Chronicles were shot in the studio. We decided to get the real Net Cafe experience. And we decided to shoot it in internet cafes all around, basically the Bay Area. We did some back east. And it was really all the key guys that were coming with new ideas, new internet cool things. We would sit around and talk. This was not about technology. We didn't do demos. But we really talked about the people and the culture of this new thing called the internet. And I had great fun doing that show. Um, we got involved back in the community aware of the Webby Awards, which was sort of the Academy Awards of the websites. And I think for several years, we produced a one-hour special each year uh, covering the Webby Awards. There was one show in particular. I think it was the very first show. The, guess what? The award for best new search engine went to a company called Google. <laughs> Well, Sergey and Larry, the two guys who founded Google, were there to accept the award. You may know these two guys are Russian, and they're big ice hockey fans. They, they were prepared to win. They called up the winners are Sergey Brin and Larry Page with Google. These guys rollerbladed down the aisle <laughs> with their hockey sticks. Somehow managed to climb up on the stage on their skates, rolled to the podium, gave, gave their acceptance speech on rollerblades. Uh, a pretty, pretty fun moment. Uh, while talking about the internet, I should mention one other thing, by the way, that most people don't know. The very first television program, full television program, half-hour television program, to be streamed on the internet was Computer Chronicles, and that was only Computer Chronicles. Back in, I think it was 1990, something called the m bone at the time, developed by a guy in Washington, D.C. So we were really excited to actually put a TV show on the web at that time. <clears throat> I want to talk about things I remember about some of the shows we did. At the time, I was working with a dot matrix printer, and Xerox announced they'd come out with a color laser printer. Wow. Now, there were laser printers out at that time, but they were expensive. Very few individual users could afford to use a laser printer. These guys had a color laser printer, so we're going to put that on the show. We'll be doing a show on printers and hard copy. So we invited Xerox to come into the studio and demonstrate the new color laser printer. The printer, I thought, was a little thing you put on your desk. And this thing was the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> a big Volkswagen, not a big one. <laughs> Came on two pallets, three engineers to install this thing, set it up, and get it working. And it took them for, I think, I don't know how long it took these guys to get this thing. And at some point, they finally said, okay, we're ready to try it. So everything was plugged in again. It was a monstrous thing, took out half the speed. And they said, so this is the print button, I'm going to press the print button. They press the print button, smoke starts to building gray smoke. Okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. I think we made a mistake. I guess so. <laughs> Give us another half hour. <laughs> twiddle it around, twiddle it around, twiddle it around. And say, okay, we're ready to try it again. Presses the print button, and the most gorgeous piece of output I've ever seen in my life came out of this printer. There's a famous picture, you may have seen it, was a picture of a baboon, face of a baboon. Brilliant resolution, brilliant color, I still have that out there. And then, wow, this is the future of output. This is spectacular. So we finally made it through the disaster with Xerox and we came up with a really good demo. Another interesting, we used to do something at the beginning of most shows, what we called the toy tease. We played with something really simple to get across the idea of what we were talking about. So we were going to do a show on robots and robotics. And as we were researching the show, we found somebody who developed a ping pong robot, a robot that could play ping pong. Cool. I mean, it didn't play itself, it played a human player. You have a human on one side, a robot on the other side. So we're going to open the show with this robot ping pong player playing the game of ping pong. I said to Gary, look, I'm not a really good ping pong player. You're better than I am. Why don't you do the demo? Sure. So they wired the whole thing up. They said, let's give it a test before we actually roll tape. And he said, do you want Gary to serve, or do you want the robot to serve first? I said, let the robot serve first. He presses the button. The robot strikes this missile right to Gary's crotch. Keep him out. What a brilliant Gary said, I'll do it again. No problem. <laughs> we 
finally got it to work, but that was a very embarrassing moment on the show. <laughs> Lots of embarrassing moments. I'll give you another moment. So we were showing off a new IBM PS2. We had John Bora come to the studio and demonstrate the PS2. It was a modular computer. It was like a computer made out of a Lego set. So you didn't have to have soldering irons. You didn't have to pull wires anywhere. You just pull these Lego blocks out. He said, let me show you. This thing is so good, so simple, so modular. I can take it apart and put it back together right here without any tools. Let's do it. So he pulls all the modules out. Starts, I said, let's put it back together now, John. Puts that module in, puts that module in, he picks up. Where did that go? Is that that slot? I think it was that slot. Didn't work. Oh, I'll try again. No problem. I know how to do this. So I got three or four goes and found, found the to how to put these modules in the right place and then it work. Sweat was pouring down his forehead. He couldn't figure out how to get this damn thing together. This happens over and over again. We don't show on technology that's never been shown before. Then we had a software example. We had Peter Norton on the show, Peter Norton Utilities, famous for that. And his claim to fame was his original program called On Erase. And he astonished people by saying, you know, when you think you delete a file, you don't really delete it, you just delete the address. And I'm going to show you how to bring back a file you thought you would delete. So let me show you how to do it. So he took this file and said, I'm going to delete this file. Watch, delete, gone. Now I'm going to bring it back. Watch this. <laughs> Sweat pouring down his mouth. I can't find it. I know it's here somewhere. I believe me, I can do it. <laughs> Stop tape. Wait till he figures it in. He picked it up again, and he was able to do it. You can't imagine how stressful it was to do these new demos at those days in a live one tape television show, and half the time didn't work. There was a standard line from the guy from the computer company that was in the studio. It worked perfectly in my Italian class. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. I'm sorry. Uh, one of the really interesting moments I found wasn't out of demo, but something was spoken by a guy from Microsoft. <coughs> we were doing a show on OS2 before. And at the time, there was sort of a competition between Windows NT and OS2 as to what was going to be the high end operating system in the future. And there was supposedly a partnership between Microsoft and IBM developing OS2. As is Microsoft's style, under the table, they were threatening to kill OS2. But that was not the public position. Here's this guy from Microsoft on the show. He says, well, Windows is a good solution, but it's not the permanent system. The all long-term operating system solution is OS2. This is spoken by a guy from Microsoft. Very telling as to what goes on at the top and what goes on inside. I was a big fan and always have been. Of course, the world has changed dramatically of speech synthesis and speech recognition. So we did a show on speech synthesis and speech recognition. And the first real product that utilized this technology was a doll from Mattel. The talking doll came out from Mattel. And with this doll, the kid could you know, press a button and say, hello, doll, how are you? The doll would say, I'm fine, how are you? What's your name? My name is doll, whatever. So we went to a Toys R Us right before Christmas, and the entire aisle was filled with these new talking dolls from Mattel. All right, let's do the demo. So we're rolling tape, the camera's pushing this thing. Now watch how this cool this thing is. I press the try me, and I say to the doll, hi, my name is Stuart, how are you? The doll says, oh, I'm fine, how are you? The doll next door says, I'm fine, how are you? The doll next door says, I'm fine, how are you? A hundred dolls start talking. <laughs> Never thought of this problem. <laughs> a great, a great, a great one. I'm very proud of the fact that we not only cover technology in this country, but we went around the world. I think we shot maybe a dozen different countries. Uh, I think we we're in France, Spain, Hong Kong, Israel, Germany, Monaco, Austria, Italy, Taiwan, Japan, Hungary, Czech Republic, and China. Let me tell you about the story of trying to shoot in China. So when we travel to another country to do a show, we bring all our gear. And at the time, there was a separate videotape recorder. It wasn't built in the camera, it was a separate camera. And we would come with our box of blank videotapes. If we were shooting on three quarter inch dramatic video cassettes at the time. So a box of about 30 cassettes, that's what we do, I think, to do this show. So we're going through customs at the Beijing airport. The guy says, what's in that box? I said, blank videotapes. What do you mean blank videotapes? I said, well, they've never been used. You see the box never been opened. What's on the tape? I said, nothing. I've got to see the tapes. I said, we never use them. Said, I've got to see the tapes, make sure there's no pornography, there's no anti-communist propaganda on there. <clears throat> For four hours, this guy stared at a blank screen. <laughs> used up all our batteries. <laughs> When we actually went to go to work, we had to spend the entire night charging all the batteries again. Four hours of staring at a blank screen. We'll never forget that one. Very proud of a show we did back in 1991, 25 plus years ago, 
and nobody ever heard the term on virtual reality. <coughs> this was a difficult show to do, again, very new cutting edge technology, so we did a VR show. We had a lot of fun doing the computer bowl shows, I don't know if you ever saw those, and we would actually produce a quiz show between the geeks from the West Coast, the geeks from the East Coast, if you knew the most about computer trivia. And number one, it got me to see how viciously competitive these guys are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially Bill Gates, by the way. He, he would not, anything, anytime he didn't win, it was unfair. <laughs> Anyhow, so we worked with, uh, I worked with Gates several times, Andy Grove, Mitch Caper, Andy Hirschfeld, and Ed Jude, who came was there, Martin Reeson, Ben Joy, Jean-Louis Gasset, uh, John Dorf, all the guys. It was great fun doing that show. It was really super smart guys who were viciously competitive. They did not like to lose. Big surprise, they were running the companies. Let me talk a little about that. As I finish talking about you, let me ask you what you think is the most popular show we have been in terms of the amount of downloads from the archive. What was the subject of that? The Commodore 64. <laughs> this is a loyal group of guys. The most popular show has been downloaded, downloaded, not viewed, downloaded over a quarter million times just from the archive let alone what's on YouTube. Who would think it's Commodore 64 guys, that there is the dedicated to that C64 as you are to the Tandy. Let me talk about how we got these shows all online, actually, because that's a pretty interesting story also. So by the mid-1990s, I guess, we had hundreds of shows on videotape sitting on the shelf. Keep in mind, over the years, the videotape formats kept on changing. So we had three quarters, and one inch, and two inch, blah, blah, blah. And I still have all these tapes lined up all these different formats which most of which you can't even play anymore. So as so what happens on the Net Cafe show we were doing, I was interviewing Brewster Kale, who had started the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive started out as really an archive of web pages. Brewster's very clever idea was if you do research, you can go to the library and look up an old magazine, you can go to the library and look up an old newspaper, but you can't go to the library and look up an old web page. They disappeared. So Brewster's idea, let's start a library of web pages so people can go back and research these things. And he started the thing called the Wayback Machine. In the Wayback Machine, you can actually put in the URL, uh, yahoo.com, 1987, and you can see it on the website at the time. It was really a brilliant idea. But the archive at the time was focused on text, because that's pretty much what the internet was at that time. All of a sudden, there's a lot of audio and video now on these websites, and they weren't prepared to handle that. So I saw what his problem was, and I said, let me tell you about my problem. I've got hundreds of television shows all about the video history of the personal computer revolution. They're sitting on the shelf, inaccessible. Why don't we build a video collection in the Internet Archive of all our shows, digitize them, and make them freely accessible to anybody? I said, are you nuts? Give them away. I said, yeah, it's what Gary would have wanted us to do. And so we started a two-year project, mostly run by volunteers, to digitize all these tapes in all these different formats. You imagine a nightmare was to find machines to run these tapes. And we built up this entire library and decided to put them online for free, downloadable for free, no advertising, no sponsors, no belonging, no registration, no subscribers. And that was a big move for us. I mean, this is a couple million dollars worth of intellectual property. But really, in honor of Gary, we said, this is the whole point in the show, let's people have access to it. Now, we put those shows on under a Creative Commons license, which had restrictions on it. You could use it for non commercial purposes only. We trusted the tech community, falsely. People started stealing this stuff left and right. To this day, everything on YouTube is pirated. We have never created a YouTube site. It's all stolen stuff, we put ads around it. I tried to fight it for a while, I just gave up, it was a losing battle. What the hell, we want people to watch it, let them watch it on YouTube. It's been a very frustrating experience. This ended up being a great online, searchable database of the video of the PC revolution. And what really fascinates me, and more people watch the show online now than ever watch them on television, I get an email every day from two types of people. Older guys, 65 year old guys, oh, I remember the good old days, it's such fun watching those old shows. But better than that, I get emails from 15 year olds. This is so cool, I had no idea what the history of all this stuff was. Mm -hmm. So really, it's, it's, the life just continues to go on as people discover this stuff. Let me talk a little bit about the uh, people we dealt with on computer problems. <coughs> and the first guy I have to talk about again is Gary Kilbaugh. You may know his story, very, very sad story. Poor Gary died at age 52. <coughs> very sad ending to his life. He just could never get over the fact that he got screwed by Bill Gates. It drove him crazy. But Bill Gates became the hero 
nobody's ever heard of Caracol. Most people have never even heard of Caracol. Well, really invented personal computer business with this thing and operating system. He just could never get used to that. He, his life really fell apart, started drinking, drugs, <coughs> lost his wife, gained weight. Believe it or not, Gary, the most gentle man you could imagine, was in a biker bar in Pacific Grove, was drunk probably, got into an argument with some guy, swung at him, knocked him down on the ground. It's tough to tell the story. Hit his head on the concrete and died three, three days later of a concussion. Incredible, incredibly sad story. Such a good man, such a good man. <clears throat> Let's talk about the IBM MS-DOS CPM battle. Because many of you know there's the great news Gary went flying with the IBM came calling. To some degree that's true, but let me tell you what Gary told me about that day. And there's lots of aspects of this. <coughs> but I was sitting with Gary one day and I said, come on, tell me the truth, what really happened when you didn't do the night meeting? This is told so much about who Gary was. So if you know they wanted to come on a Saturday. That was my wife's birthday. I had promised my wife I would take her flying day. And I wasn't going to cancel that for some day in my meeting. And this is the kind of Gary was. His loyalty to his wife is more important than a billion dollar degree. At the end. There, again, there's many other aspects of the story. But this is the kind, Gary was not a businessman. Gary was not one of these viciously competitive guys. He was a brain guy. He was an innovator, developer, coder. And that was an example of it. I think you know the story of what eventually happened with IBM and CPM and MS DOS. Gary was certainly not a businessman. And that was one of those great weaknesses. Great technology guy, but not a businessman. They eventually made a deal with IBM. And it was a compromise. IBM said, look, when we come out with a computer, we'll put CPM on there, but we also want to put MS-DOS on there. And let the market decide which one is the best. Gary said, no problem, we're going to win that battle. What Gary didn't know, which wasn't in the contract, was that IBM was going to charge $240 for CPM and $40 for MS-DOS. Guess who won? <laughs> Six to one price difference. <laughs> Gary got screwed, never got over that. I might say Bill Gates is certainly a tough, hard-nosed businessman, but I did spend some time with Bill over the years, and I'm not like most guys, and I don't think he's a jerk. Steve Jobs, jerk. Bill Gates, not a jerk. Uh, a really smart guy, no question about it. Tough business guy, no question about it. Absolutely wants to win. But a decent guy, a smart guy, a cooperative guy, uh, always got along well with him. Uh, to everybody's surprise, I've never been a guy to bad mouth Gates, except yeah, they sort of screwed Gary, but that was little mistakes on both sides in that negotiation. Bill Gates told me two brilliant things, not to do with technology, but to do with managing a large company. Remember at the time, Microsoft owned the world. I mean, computers around the world, software around Microsoft, the operating system, the application, Microsoft Office Suite, etc. So I said to him, what are some of your basic rules of how you manage a monster company like this? He said, well, I have one basic rule. So I got tired of all the managers coming in to me for a meeting and telling me how great everything was. I said, everything is great, you have no problem? Everything is great. <clears throat> and he said, this can't be the case. I made a rule. Every time somebody comes to me in a meeting and says something to me, if he's a good news, he must give me a piece of bad news. That was a brilliant piece of management. Tell me what's bad. Don't just tell me what's good. Because what's bad needs my help. What's good doesn't need my help. What a, Creative mind to think about that. We can the other thing that amazed me with Gary, with uh, Bill, at the time, again, remember, this was a Microsoft world in the early 90s. Windows had taken off, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, uh, you know, what, do you th what do you worry about? So I wake up every morning worrying about what I didn't think about. Where are we going? Who's going to take us on? And of course, what he hadn't thought about was networking. But he was smart enough to know he didn't know. And I just was very impressed with Bill as a guy. And look what he did with his life. He gave up the whole tech business and spends his billions of dollars screwing health problems around the world. He was really a good guy. We had George Morrow filled in actually after Gary left the show as a co-host for a while. George was a really bright guy, very clever guy. He came out with, you may remember, the Pivot one first luggable, actually, he was smaller than the Osborne in the combat, with a luggable portable computer. And this is interesting for people who went to floppy disks. George was on the show actually as a, as a Provider, and he showed me the Pivot One and he used five and a quarter inch floppy disk. 
Apple had just come out with three and a half inch. George very proudly said, everybody's stuff is on five and a quarter. Who wants to buy a computer that doesn't show five, play five and a quarter? He, he was wrong, he went out of business. But <laughs> it was a way of thinking, and he had his right foot up in the world. Dealt uh, a little bit with Michael Dell, totally in the Steve Jobs category. <clears throat> Did not like him. Let me tell you another Steve Jobs story. So there's some years later when the Lisa computer was coming out, I remember Lisa. Mm -hmm. And there was a big event at the Vienza College Auditorium in the Bay Area, which they're going to announce the Lisa. And Steve did his usual splashy demonstration and showed the new Lisa, blah, blah, blah. After the demonstration was over, they invited journalists to come up on the stage and do the one on ones with Steve. But what everybody was talking about in Silicon Valley is why is this damn computer called the Lisa? It's a funny name for a computer. And the word was Lisa was the name of his illegitimate daughter, who he never admitted to the about. I thought it was pretty damn interesting. Everybody was talking about it. So everybody else was talking about the specs of Lisa, and I came up and said, Steve, we're going to ask you a question that everybody's asking me. What's the story and why it's called the Lisa? That's not an appropriate question. Whoa. A lot of people are asking that. Get out and expect this fist accident. Security, get this guy out of here. Whoa. This kind of guy, Steve Johnson. Really obnoxious punk. <laughs> Clever, brilliant, but not a nice man. Apple, let me say a word about Apple. Now, they're obviously a great company. They want to do wonderful products, great marketing, great design, et cetera, et cetera. But they are not a customer friendly company. Let me tell you my experience. Maybe some of you have the same experience. So I logged on one day to my computer and it said, Oh, why don't you upgrade from your 70 to High Sierra? Much better experience. Yeah, sure, why not? Click, all of a sudden, your 70 was gone and I had some High Sierra. But they didn't tell me. Is about a thousand dollars worth of software I had wouldn't work anymore. Yeah. All my video software is dead. Won't play under my stare. Apple stole a thousand dollars worth of software from me, rudely, without even warning me that this is what's going to happen if I upgraded. That was disgraceful behavior. This is not a company that cares about its customer. I was furious about that. Anyhow, that's Jobs <laughs> and Apple. Uh, Talked with Sergey Brin several times, really nice guy, bright guy, very impressed with the early days of Google. And Google was a startup working out of, I forget this woman's name, Living. <clears throat> they were a really good company. They didn't need a motto of do no evil, they weren't doing evil. Always worried about a company that needed a motto of do no evil. You think that comes with the territory. But no, when Google went public and there were billions of dollars on the table, that company changed dramatically. With money, 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 not let's make a better life for people. Uh, very disappointed in what happened with Google. Of course, they changed their motto, it's not do no evil to do the right thing. It's a little more accessible, I guess. Had Steve Case on the show, a really nice guy, the guy who started AOL before that quantum leap. Um, good man, Steve Wozniak, he's in the Gary category, absolute gem of a man. Adam Osborne was a guy I really respected. I don't know how many people remember Adam Osborne, but he came out with one of the first luggable computers in the city, the Osborne One. Uh, he couldn't compete with Compaq when they came out with a similar machine. And then moved over to software and started selling out low-cost software, really clones of things like Lotus 123. He got sued by Lotus, I put out of business. He died in a very sad life a couple years after that. We had Jerry Yang on the show talking about when Yahoo first came out, good man. The most interesting odd couple I've ever seen in the tech business was Jack Tremiel and Gary Kilgore. <laughs> complete opposites. Gary was the in, 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 you know, inner thought kind of guy, techy guy. Jack Chanel used to be, I think it was a sewing machine shopper. <laughs> he just knew retail and selling boxes. Gary had nothing about that. He knew nothing about technology. I don't think he'd ever been in Silicon Valley. And somehow these two guys got together with their new division called Active Venture and then Active Vision. And actually Gary worked with Jack to do some of his multimedia products that came out of his company. A uh, really odd combination. Um, let me tell you one other interesting story. So we had many CEOs on the show who come into the studio to demonstrate their products. And, what I, and we wanted to get the top guy in the company, that's the PR guy, so we often fought to get the CEO. What happened almost every single time is the CEO would come in and he didn't know anything about the product. <coughs> he didn't know how to use it. Classic scene was, there's the CEO on the set, ready to do things. It's like, well, guy was under the table. F2, press F2. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> I 
want to talk just a little bit about the Silicon Valley culture at that time because there's kind of a Stepford Wives quality to it. When you talk to all these CEOs, we're going to make the world a better place, we're going to make life easier for human beings, blah, 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 which was the Stepford Life line. Underneath, we're going to make a million dollars fast. The competitive culture in Silicon Valley was vicious, glossed over by this, oh, we're going to change the world and do good things for people, and so on and so forth. It was a really tough time to accept some of that stuff. Let me talk about why there is no more computer chronicles. So this was 2002, and you remember that was the dot-com bust. So for several years in the dot-com boom, money was just pouring into the public money for stupid ideas that had no chance of ever making a profit. And people got burned, and a lot of money was lost, and it was hard to raise money in the valley at that time. So one problem was the dot-com bust, and people losing faith in new technologies. Second thing is the computer business has changed radically over 20 years. Our Ace in the hole was we said to sponsors, everybody who watches our show is a customer. They're looking to be told, what's cool, what should I buy? 20 years later, everybody had a customer can do it. So the game we were playing introducing people to this whole idea wasn't the same anymore. Matter of fact, I had an interesting conversation. I don't remember his name. The guy at the time was the editor of Macro Magazine. He said, Stu, he said, when computers become like refrigerators, you just open them and close them, we're both out of business. And he was right. People didn't need as much the kind of stuff we were doing. The other thing that happened was, quite frankly, it was a very dull period starting in the early 2000s. Uh, Microsoft kind of owned the software world. IBM at the time sort of owned the hardware world. Startups had been just put out of business by these two big monsters. And it really wasn't as interesting as it had been before. We were having a little bit of struggle coming up with really cool new stuff. So there was a lull in innovation. There were lots of mergers and acquisitions, which made things less competitive. And frankly, I had been doing this show for 20 years, 52 weeks a year, and I was tired. I needed a break. So let's rethink this. Let's pull the show off the air for a while. It was so hard to raise the money. It was so hard to do what we'd done before. And I had a day job still. I was running TV station. Uh, so we decided to pull it off and see what happens. And not much happened. Uh, let me tell you what happened next. So. After taking down Chronicles, I was actually pretty impressed with what we'd done with Internet Archive and digitizing all our computer chronicle shows. That was a major move at the time, for, certainly for the archive, certainly for us. And actually, Brewster Kale called me when he heard I wasn't doing the show anymore. He said, what you did with us for Computer Chronicles, could you do the same thing and manage our getting other video collections like yours? Because what you did was so successful. I said, sounds like a great challenge. So I actually went to work with the nonprofit Internet Archive for a couple of years, helping them build their collection from, again, text, to audio, and video. Now it's a gigantic collection of God knows how many petabytes. <coughs> Let me tell you one really two sad stories about my work as an internet archive. We had started something in the archive called terrible name, open source video. <laughs> totally geeky, lousy user, user interface, terrible front end, but the idea was brilliant. But now bandwidth had become less expensive, storage was less expensive. We said we will host your videos whatever they are. Upload them, and we'll carry them for you. Really an idea. And it was very successful. It was too successful. In the context we were in in this nonprofit, I kind of kept doing to our management team saying, we've got to really something high at this idea of hosting for free user-generated videos. And I said, how are you going to make money showing videos of cats playing the piano? <laughs> <laughs> trust me, I said. <laughs> they didn't trust me. Uh, what happened next was very sad. So they didn't want to invest any money in making open source video better. A couple other guys did have the idea of stealing our idea and making it better, and they started something called YouTube. Yeah. San Mateo, California, right down the street from us. In fact, when they were about to start YouTube, the guys from YouTube called me. and said, look, we've got the great user interface, we've got the great platform, we've got the, open, the front end. You've got the content, we don't have any content. We work together, use your content, use our front end. Great idea. Got next time on management. So what happened next, a couple months later, YouTube launched, <clears throat> the biggest thing that's ever happened. A couple months later, they sold YouTube to Google for $1.6 billion. Wow. We really blew it. People <laughs> wouldn't believe it. Anyhow, the next really interesting experience I had in the Internet Archive <clears throat> was a similar problem to what I had with Computer Chronicles. It turned out, I found out that NASA was really interested in doing what we had done by putting, creating a website with all video. NASA owned, as I owned the history of the personal computer revolution, NASA owned the video of the American Space Program 50 years ago. 
as is my problem, they had tapes sitting on shelves, in some cases films sitting on shelves rotting away. Nobody had access to this valuable stuff. Finally, they woke up and asked one day, we've got to solve this problem. So they put out an RFP, a request for proposal, for somebody to come along and say, can you build a website for us? So we'll archive all our videos so people can access them. Well, I was crazy enough to bid on this. I actually wrote the proposal up against lots of big companies. We were a small nonprofit. And believe it or not, NASA picked us to do this. Because we were doing exactly the same thing. We'd done the same thing before. So excited. I mean, worked that, I think a year or two I spent working with NASA, the smartest people I'd ever come across, the nicest people I'd ever come across. So we made the deal with NASA, but as would happen with the YouTube disaster, I could not convince management of the archive that this is worth investing in. We, NASA had never picked an outside vendor to do something like this before. We were the first ones. I couldn't figure out how they were going to make money on this. <clears throat> and I was not able to deliver on the promises I had made to NASA about how we were going to do this. And so they basically pulled the plug on it and I quit in our archive at the time because I was just too embarrassed that I had made promises I couldn't keep. But I had a second play in mind. NASA archives was focused exclusively on NASA content. I said, let's go beyond that. That's not the only space program in the world. There's the Russian space program, there's a the Japanese program, there's a the European space program. So I went to work with a company in Boston called Image Fortress, which was doing things very similar to what we were doing. And I said, let's build a site called the International Space Archives. This is a for-profit company. Great idea, great fun. I had never known what the pressures of a startup were. The pressure for me to bring money in, to do things that I didn't think were ethical to do, just to bring money in. I, I wasn't comfortable doing it. So I quit that too because my reputation was worth more than what I was going to have on this company. So that was a sad story also. Actually being so frustrated with my experience with for-profit startups, I totally dropped out and went to academia and became a professor of broadcast journalism at the University of Nevada's Reynolds School of Journalism, which was great fun. And that's really basically since then, I did that for a couple of years, but I couldn't afford to really do that much longer. The pay is terrible for university professors, or at my level, anyhow. So since then, I've been doing freelance production, a little bit in the tech field, but really I've been very interested in technology and the healthcare field, and some personal experiences myself, which got me interested in that. Uh, and sort of brought that over because I did a special for PBS on great music for the piano. I did a five part special for the Fox Business Network on palm oil, which is a long story I don't have time to get into. People are always telling me, why didn't you relaunch Computer Chronicles? You just have to accept the fact that the world has changed. I mean, every guy with an iPhone in a basement can do some version of Computer Chronicles these days. I just didn't want to go through those all. And our show was an expensive show to do. It cost us a million bucks to really do that show. And I just didn't have the stomach to run around with my hand outside and use my box and like to do the show again. The world had changed too much. So every, every week, there's some new thing. Oh, I was only doing a show this week. I'd love to cover that Sunday. <laughs> so I didn't get to do that. I'm just going to get tired of fighting the money battle. Um, so I'm back to being a tech geek, a consumer. Um, very interested in things like virtual reality, artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, um, the Internet of Things. What's happening with mobile and voice fascinates me. How we've gotten to things like Alexa and Google Assistant and Siri and Google. I mean, we did shows on speech for years. They never worked until about two years ago. Uh, I'm really focused on privacy issues on the web. I'm really upset with what's going on in which people like Facebook are making money on material that they're giving for nothing. What a great business to be in. Your supply costs are zero, and you can basically charge people for using that content. I'm just upset with commercialization of the web, as many early web founders are. It drives me nuts when I click on seeing something, I kind of see it. I've got to watch some in 30 second commercial. Yeah, yeah. It drives me nuts. So my current <laughs> passion on the end is to start something I call the PBS of the internet. A quiet, peaceful, non-commercial place where you can surf the web, do what you want to do, and get out of there without being bombarded. Add after add after add. I don't know why that won't kick off, but that's what I'm trying to do. Even though we put all the archive stuff, the computer chronicle shows and Metcafe shows online, they actually are all copyrighted. And we still are in the business of licensing that content. We worked with CNN for a couple of years. They did a tech show in the 80s, tech on the 90s. They licensed a lot of our material. Every day I get calls from people around the world who are doing documentaries or feature films looking for this video, which basically nobody else has. So we do a little bit of that. 
I actually worked on an interesting project, especially for me, the Steve Jobs Opera, which came in about a year ago at the Santa Fe Opera. And I spent a lot of time researching Jobs and Apple at the time after they died, of course. And uh, I learned a lot, but I didn't know about Apple and Steve. Didn't change my opinion. <laughs> but it was really interesting. I mean, Jobs was such an interesting character. Apple was such a, for a while, screwed up company, uh, which obviously came back from the dead and he was almost out of business at some point. It was really interesting working on that. I actually put together a computer conference around the premium of the opera, talking about Apple and Steve Jobs. I actually wrote a book called Darwin's Dilemma. I've always been fascinated by interspecies communication. I've done some research with Coco the Gorilla and did sign language and wrote a book about that, which I'm still trying to get published. I've talked to some of you about, everybody's asking me, why don't you do a book about the inside story of Computer Chronicles? The good news is, I have all the notes, all the documentation from every show we ever did. The bad news is, it's going to take hundreds of hours of work <laughs> to turn this into a book. I'm trying to get going on that. It's kind of difficult. My passion at the moment is Gary Kilhall and the play with him. I mean, this story has to be told. It's such a great story. It's a sad story. It's a meaningful story. with so many messages in there. We got the play finished. We're ready to go. We decided not to do it as a play because it's really hard to raise money for something that vanishes after a couple of weeks. So we're working now on getting money to do either a feature film or a TV special. It's called The Forgotten Computer Genius. Appropriate title. And that's what I'm trying to get done right now. In terms of communicating and publishing and journalism, basically it's my Twitter account. I tweet every now and then with weird tech stories, and that is my continuing attempt to say something of value to people. That's about it, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting.